the steps uh, in the handout, it goes through you know each uh, step in implementing DRL as well as the other differential reinforcement procedures. Once you understand one of them, they have a lot of commonalities and they're not that difficult to once you have one or two of them down. It can be a little confusing in the beginning, but if you keep practicing and looking at them, these are very useful tools for you to have and I think you'll use them all the time in your work with kids. This is a graph or example from some data that um, a kid that I worked with and the target behavior was talk outs during class. So the first thing we did is we took his baseline data. This was a young man with Asperger's syndrome who just would blurt out answers and say things all the time. So we collected baseline data for five days so we get this nice little baseline data that has this ascending trend on the end here. It goes up. So the last day you had 20 talkouts in one class period. That's a lot of talkouts. So on average, it happened about 15 times in a class period. So we set up a DRL program. If he had 15 or fewer talkouts, he could earn a reinforcer. And for him, the reinforcer is he loved to get up and talk. So he could have five minutes at the end of class to get up and do a mini presentation about something that he was interested in. And the teacher gave him a list of topics to choose from because it might have been scary for him to completely come up with these on his own. But he got really excited about this. You know, he's like, can I do a PowerPoint? Can I bring in audiovisual aids? So he was, he was really into this and it was something he wanted to do. So he found it, it was very motivating. So we gave him a little chart and we we're eventually going to teach him self-monitoring as well. Well the first day of intervention he was doing really well and then it was a topic that he was really interested in and he just really had a hard time so he, he went over 15 the first day and he was really disappointed and he said well I'll try harder next time so the next day lo and behold he got exactly 15 and then he earned his reinforcer he was able to do his little mini presentation and then the next day he went even lower and then the next day he went back to 15 again. This is real common. What you'll see with DRL is kids will learn exactly what they can get away with and that's what they'll do. So you know, don't expect their behavior to improve much beyond what the DRL limit is. His intervention it was once he earned the reinforcer um, three days in a row. We left it at three. Then we would decrease it by three, I believe. So, yeah. So we went from 15 down to about 12 being his level. The first day he didn't earn it. He kept doing it at 15. You see that a lot also. It's kind of hard to make that transition. So we left it and then the next day he was right at 12 again and he stayed at or below 12. And we actually should have changed it here, but we just didn't. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Um, we messed up a little. So he stayed at this level a little longer than he should have. Then we went to DRL 9. And notice on this graph I'm doing a dashed line every time we change the intervention. And then there's a solid line between baseline and intervention. These are called phase change lines, remember, and they indicate on a graph when you've made a change in your program. And then you label it up here to show what that change was. So every time he met the criteria for reinforcement, we lowered the DRL limit until we got it down to three. So if he had three talkouts per less in a class period, he could do a little presentation. And this was pretty effective, and we decided to leave it there. The next thing we actually did that's not on the graph is we started thinning the schedule of reinforcement. So instead of doing a little presentation every day, he had to earn he had to meet the DRL limit two days in a row and then he could do a little presentation. And then we made it three days in a row. And we kind of left it there. We were happy if he could do if he could keep it together for three days in a row and then do a little short presentation at the end of the third day, that was good enough. This was all in a history class, by the way. I have had a lot of success using DRL. 
again, you're not going to use this with a serious behavior. I mean, even though it's real effective in decreasing a behavior, look how many times the behavior continued to occur. I mean, it still happens a lot, even though it decreases a lot as well. I think the reason this works so well is you're not asking a whole lot of the student. And for a lot of behaviors, uh, this is very appropriate. You know, it, all the kids talked out once in a while, and when we got it down to three, he really didn't look that much different from the other kids in the class. You would certainly never use this with a behavior that you wanted to eliminate, and you'd never use it with a serious behavior simply because it's not going to decrease the behavior fast enough. However, for some behaviors, this is exactly what you need. And I find this is something that I use over and over again, and I think you'll find it a very useful tool as well. This is another example of uh, a DRL for you to look at, and this one's nail biting. Um, and it uses percentages as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about another variation of differential reinforcement. This is called vicarious differential reinforcement. If you remember early on in the course, we talked about proximity praise. You know, if a kid is um, engaging in problem behavior that's kind of a mild, low level behavior, you can reinforce other kids who are behaving appropriately. This is sort of a fancy version of proximity praise it's done a little more systematically. So the idea is instead of directly reinforcing a kid, uh, if the kid's engaging in problem behavior, you reinforce students or peers on a schedule. And this uses um, modeling and, and those uh, other, you know, modeling and uh, the fact that it's uh, another kid being reinforced uses that as a um, a way to change behavior. Um, you have to specify first of all what's a reinforcer, what are the behaviors you're going to reinforce. If you've picked really uh, good uh, appropriate behaviors for your class, in other words if you have clear expected behaviors or rules or guidelines, this is very easy to do. You're reinforcing other kids for following the expectations all the time. And that student sees other kids getting reinforced and it in some instances the student is more likely to model the behavior that's getting reinforced. This works better when you have a kid who is doing things to get your attention. It's going to be less effective if the behavior is maintained by something like escape. Okay, These are test examples. I'd like you to look at each example and then tell me what kind of differential reinforcement program is being used. Okay, write this down and we'll talk about it in class. We'll do this with each of these. We'll look at the examples and then you tell me what's being used. I'm not going to give them here, but this is something I'd like you to do or when we get together again.